Please welcome Jennifer Egan and Anna Quendlin. Hello, everybody. <laughs> We're very happy to be here. And uh, two journalists interviewing each other. So we thought that since we're talking about the writing process, um, the best place to start would be t with the beginning of that process. So I will start by just asking Anna, how, how do you begin? And is it different each time? Or is there a kind of a, for, a is there a, a, an evolution that is often the same among books? Well, when I saw what we were talking about today, Jenny, all I could think of was um, the time several years ago when I was at a book party and talking to Edgar Doctorow, known to most of you as E.L. And he said, what are you working on? And I said, well, I'm getting ready to go on book tour. And he said, oh, poor you. Now you'll have to go out there and pretend that you know how we do what we do. <laughs> I felt a profound sense of relief because I'd always been confused about exactly how we do what we do, but the idea that Dr. O was confused about it too made me feel a lot better. I would say that the genesis for me is walking around time. Um, I either um, run or walk um, four miles every morning, usually in New York, but this morning I did it here. And during those mornings, and then during the course of the day, characters start to speak to me, which makes me sound totally crazy. Um, I, I just start to think about a protagonist, and, and after a while I start to think about what she does for a living, and who she lives with, and, and I haven't put a single word down on paper by that um, it usually takes me six to seven months of thinking about her and enlarging her world until there's a whole cast of characters who are doing different things which constitute plot. And one day it becomes so clear to me that it's time to start writing because so much is going on. My memory is completely shot. If I don't sit down and start working on the book, then... Um, uh, I'm going to be lost, and that's usually how it begins for me. In what looks like making pot roast, or um, running, or lying in bed at night not able to sleep, but it's actually really generative. What about you? Okay, wait, a couple okay. of questions before that. So I'm assuming you're taking notes as you're in these months of cogitating about these characters and what they do and what their world is. Correct? Um, not extensive notes. I have sort of sporadic, like, things that will say, twins, question mark. <laughs> and half of the time I come back to them and say, ah, yes. And half of the time I come back and say, what was that all about? I mean, I don't know about you, but when I take notes as I'm working, I would say about half of them turn out to be dry holes that, that just are going nowhere. Um, but I do take notes, but more of it is, when I'm writing a novel, I'm living in the world of the novel. Um, so that sometimes at the end of the day, if it's been a really good day, which don't come that often, I sort of shake my head and go, oh, here I am back in the house in New York City because I've been living in Miller's Valley or I've been living in the middle of nowhere with Rebecca Winter or uh, so on and so forth. And, and, and so living in the world, I sort of know the world in a way that makes it less necessary for me to take notes. Okay. You do a lot of note taking, right? I do. Wait, one more question, and then I really will. I will answer too. I but really want her to talk. <laughs> but I, I'm just curious. So, okay, months of thinking, some note taking, some, some of it not useful. So, what then? How do you know where to start? Where do you actually? You're at a computer, I assume. Yes. So, how does sentence one get written? With all those months of walking around, actually, chapter one has sort of coalesced in my mind, which is really great um, because I sit down and actually getting chapter one on paper feels a little bit more like stenography than it normally mm -hmm. does. And it also feels like, this is good. 
I can do this, which is good because so much of the rest of the process is saying, this is terrible, I've wasted my life, I'm a, I'm a dreadful writer. And so having that first chapter be more cooked than anything else is in my mind really helps me move ahead with the rest of it. So you kind of get a running start that Exactly. Way. You? Very different. Um, so I, uh, with fiction, I tend to really start with just a time and a place. And that might seem like very little, and in a way it is very little, but, it's, but it can be hard to actually know whether a time and a place are kind of rich enough and strong enough for me to, to, for it to really yield up a world. But what I tend to do is I sit down and I, I write in a very unconscious, automatic way. And, I, and what I'm really trying to do is sort of get to the realm that is deeper than ideas I could think of consciously. Mm -hmm. So I start with time and a place, and there are no people yet. The people sort of come almost immediately, but I think the analogy would have to be dreaming. You know, if you think about it, we are all incredible creators when we go to sleep. We create these rich, symbolic texts that trans transmute life as we know it into something that we might not even recognize. And sometimes these are really compelling narratives with symbols and bright, exciting, you know, um, sequences of events. And I feel like that's kind of the, the part of my brain I'm trying to access with my first draft. But it's setting rather than characters it's to begin? It's setting first, and then the characters, you know, are like the next thing. And then they eventually do things, and that becomes the plot. What? But what I should say, and I know we're certainly going to talk about revision, which is, I'm sure, an important part of your process too, but you know, what I get in writing in this very intuitive way for my first drafts is a big mess. <laughs> um, because you know, it's, uh, this is not an organized way to approach writing. I, I think what I gain is those unconscious impulses and ideas that are hopefully better than the ones I can think of consciously. What I lose is control. So I have really no control over that first draft. And I, my whole method is about facilitating this process. And the number one um, aspect of that is that I write fiction by hand. So I have terrible handwriting. I can't really read it, frankly. Sometimes I never can read it. Um, and, uh, and so it, it has a blindness about it because I, I, on some level, I actually am writing, but I'm not really reading what I'm writing in the way that I do if I'm looking at a screen and it's, you know, what I'm writing is staring back at me in a typeface. So do you have a lot of days where you start writing and you sort of go into this fugue state and like an hour later you go, oh my God? and sort of wake up? Um, I, no, it's not quite that um, extreme. It's, it's, it has a pretty you know, work-a-day aspect to it. I mean, when I'm writing original material, I try to write five to seven pages a day. So I am just trying to fill those five to seven pages, and often when I get to the end of page five, I'm like, am I done yet? Thank God, okay, I'm done. So often, I mean, a fugue state is, you know, is the ideal. That's like the day you describe where you think, wow, you know, that was really enveloping. Those are the best days. Yeah, but there are many days where it feels like I'm doing nothing, but interestingly, I, write, I read over what I wrote the previous day, and that's the only rereading I do until I have a complete draft. Oh, and that, that can be hundreds of pages. And so when I read over what I did the, the day before, which I'm doing just to re-enter the flow, it's often a little better than I thought. So you know, sometimes that feeling we have about what we're doing is not really representative of the quality of what we've done. So my... my Second Son is a young adult novelist, and he says he thinks there's two kinds of, of writers. The ones who write something, and then the next day go back and fine tune it, and then the next day go back and fine tune it some more, and what he calls the run like hell to the end writers. And he and I are both run like hell to the end writers, and it sounds like you are too. Very much so. And one problem with this very blind way of writing is, there, it, with almost every book, I go actually off the rails at a certain point. Mm -hmm. Like I actually am going in the wrong direction. So usually my revision process begins with lopping off a certain amount of that first draft and just saying, uh-oh, okay, we'll come back through it and hope that it, it, you know, I can actually find my way. 
Um, but maybe this, so maybe this is a good segue into revision. So you sit down, you, you, that first chapter, you kind of hit the ground running, it's been waiting to come out. And it, it doesn't, it t talk about how revision fits into your process as you're going through. Okay, well one of the big differences between us that we sussed out when we were talking earlier is, I really, first of all, I hate to write. That's <laughs> number one, I hate to write, hate it, hate it, I mean, you know, it's, a, it's bad that they invented Apple TV because it's yet another excuse for me not to write. Um, but I really hate to revise. Um, my, my fantasy is, and, but even if you like to revise, all of us have this fantasy. You're going to hand in the first draft and your editor and agent are going to call you and say, oh, it's perfect. You don't need to change a thing. That has not yet happened. Um, so I'm, I'm really sort of snarky about revision. What I do before I revise that I find really helpful is when I finish a first draft, I read the entire book aloud because my eye will forgive things that my ear won't. So if a sentence is too long, when you're reading it aloud and you can't breathe at the end, it's God's way of asking for a semicolon, <laughs> or two sentences. And also, I think, especially with dialogue, if you read aloud, you can hear that it's not the way people talk, or you can hear the clunks in your... So I get some of this stuff out by the reading aloud thing. And I'm better on revision, and tell me if this has happened with you. I've had the same editor for every book. Her name is Kate Medina at Random House. I feel like her name should be on the cover in, in some sort of print as well. And I've absorbed Kate's voice into my mm -hmm. head more than it was at the beginning. So now sometimes as I'm in mid-book, I hear Kate saying, does this description serve the reader? And I think, oh, shut up, Kate. Um, <laughs> but sometimes that description becomes less than it would have been had I not heard Kate's voice. Um, but Kate still does a major edit and says to me, you know, um, I, I feel like there's too much backstory here. I feel like there's not enough backstory there. I feel like this whole s chapter slows down the book. I'm not quite sure what this character, and after I stomp around for a week or so, I do about 60% of what um, she tells me to do because by the time I'm done a draft, I don't know about you, it's not even that I can't see the forest for the trees. I can't see the trees. I don't, I don't know what's there. I, 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 I'm almost so in the world of the book that I can't tell anymore. I mean, do you feel like your drafts are... Well, it's different. So because I'm writing by hand in this blind fashion, the first thing I have to do is type it. I mean, it's a logistical issue. With Manhattan Beach, my last book, the, my first draft, which I wrote over the course of a year and a half, was... Um, you know, it was like a thousand pages <laughs> on legal pads, um, which ended up being, I don't know, some hundreds typed. So first of all, just imagine typing that. Now I have a rule, which is that I do not make any changes as I type, because in a way it's just, I, I have to see what the whole is. And it takes a lot of restraint, because I'm often typing horrible stuff that I desperately want to change, but I don't know what to change it to. So I just, I don't do that. I'm, I'm just a conduit for this material to turn into something I can actually read. Let me, uh, so do, do you not do the typing until you've done the entire draft on legal pages? If I'm writing one continuous book, like with A Visit from the Goon Squad, which I wrote in parts, I was dealing with smaller parts. But, but, one, but Manhattan Beach? 25 legal pads. And, and then I had at to the type. end of it? Months of typing. Okay. Yeah. I had forgotten... I didn't know what happened in the book I by know. the time I was typing it. You always, for, you always forget. <laughs> I forgot characters' names. I would rename them. They would get new personalities. And then I, I could choose. I could pick which one was the best. Um, no, it, I, I, I was truly, it was a mysterious object to me um, when I typed it. So then once I have the typed version, then I read it. And of course, that is terribly painful right. because I'm now subjecting to, you know, typed... Uh, pages, this outpouring of like, you know, sort of dream level synthesized material. 
And so a certain kind of grieving process is necessary then. I mean, I, I think it's hopeless, it's terrible, but hopefully there are some things that were surprising and interesting. Once I've kind of had a chance to really think about it in a very active way, I, then I create an outline for the first time. And the outline is sort of trying to um, clarify what I have and then, and then make my, a list of what needs to change to get to my next big draft. And those first outlines are really long. I mean, the, the um, you know, I think for Manhattan Beach, it was at least 50 pages of outline in 10-point type of just what I needed to do. But, but how much of that, I'm really interested, especially with Manhattan Beach, because you're working over decades and periods of history that are critical to the story. Are you keeping track of them as you go, or are you keeping track of them when you do that outline? I, I did a lot of research before I started, which of course was, was in a way very general research since I didn't have a plot. It was hard to know what I was researching, but <laughs> the research itself actually generated a lot of what the book ended up being about, like um, deep sea diving. That really was not my intention originally. Um, a sort of mobster, you know, organized crime, um, I had not planned for that to be in the book, but in doing my research, it, it, actually, this is sort of interesting, I was doing a lot of oral history research for Manhattan Beach, just trying to talk, you know, this, the World War II era is, is going to slip out of living memory right. in the next 20 years. And so I was doing this research in the first decade of, of the 21st century, um, but I was, you know, trying to talk to as many people with good memories who were then in their 80s. And it was fascinating how certain refrains came up again and again. And one was, so many people knew gangsters. Like the word gangster was just, would appear. And I thought, that's really not true nowadays. And for example, I was speaking to one guy who was telling me about all the luminaries who lived in his apartment building, on Central, uh, which was on Central Park. And there was like a movie star, there was a famous banker, and there was Frank Costello, a crime boss. And I thought, you know, I'm picturing the co-op board nowadays <laughs> in, in Manhattan. Picture, Frank Costello, job description, crime boss. I don't think he gets into the building. <laughs> um, so what it made me realize was that organized crime, and, and in fact the, the sort of job title, gangster, had a very different meaning then. And as I dug deeper, I realized that that all really originated with prohibition and the notion that quote-unquote gangsters were basically liquor dealers and most people still wanted to drink during Prohibition. So these were, and, and then I, you know, a gangster ended up being one of my major characters. I could never have decided that ahead of time though, ah. because I didn't know all those things. So the research yielded the material. And then of course, once I started writing, I really had to start researching because now I actually had some sense of what was going to happen. You need to share with them the mistake that you made at the beginning oh. of the book that you told me about because for anybody who thinks that we <laughs> really are, are, are intensely doing. competent, this is a great... Okay, so it, I had this idea, so I did all that research and now I'm actually writing. I'm, I've got my gangster and you know my diver or my wannabe diver and things are moving forward. And I, ha I, I knew that I was going to be writing about women working at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And that also came out of my research. Um, and so I thought, I have an idea. The, the, the big dramatic event of the first section of the book is going to be Pearl Harbor. You know, these women are working at the yard, but we're, America's not in the war yet. And then there's going to be this dramatic moment where Pearl Harbor happens and everyone knows what the consequences of that are. I wrote this in my crazy, rough, you know, first draft <coughs> way, not having bothered to absorb the fact that no women worked at the Brooklyn Navy Yard until September 1942. So this was absolutely outside the realm of possibility. I had to fix it. <laughs> but, but do we... Uh, I'm really interested in this question of what we can do in fiction given the fact that it's a fictional world. So I remember I was working on this novel called Black and Blue and part of the, the novel was that this woman was going to take her son and flee to Florida. And at a certain point I thought, okay, I don't really know Florida that well. I'm gonna make an airline reservation and go down there and walk around and absorb stuff. And of course, I'd been a reporter and then a columnist for many years at that point. And one morning I thought, no, you don't need to go to Florida, Anna. This isn't 
a literal Florida. This is your Florida. This is the Florida of your book, which doesn't necessarily have to conform to what actual Florida is like. But it sounds like you couldn't have... Where, where's the nexus of the facts and the fiction for you? Here's how it worked for this book, and I, I really agree with you. I mean, I feel like I, I'm sure you have a sense of Florida, and your version of Florida is, is perfectly acceptable to me with whether or not it conforms to literal Florida. I think the difference for Manhattan Beach was because it is historical fact. Let's say I had taken that liberty and had women working in the Navy Yard before September 1942. It's so lame. I mean, anyone who knows the history is, is immediately going to lose that suspension of disbelief that is essential for a book to be a pleasure. So I didn't, I, I, what I found was that I had to know everything, or as close as I could get to knowing everything, in order to know where I could take my liberties. And I really do take liberties. But here's an example. So I have, I really wanted to write about a female diver. I immediately learned that in the, in the uh, Navy, women didn't dive until the 70s, and in the Army, they didn't dive until the 80s. So if I'm going to have a female military diver, that's just as lame as having women at the Navy Yard before September 1942. I wasn't going to do that. However, I learned that there were hundreds of civilian divers in New York and at the Navy Yard, and those programs are relatively undocumented. So no one knows who dove. Is it likely that women dove? No. It, but it seemed unlikely that women would have been riveting at the Brooklyn Navy Yard before September 1942. So that was a liberty I felt comfortable taking. And uh, because part of it is, we don't know. So that's an opportunity for me. Do you think you would have cared about much of that if you hadn't once been a journalist? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think I would have, because I, I feel like engaging with the historical record creates a kind of, um, I almost want to say obsession, with knowing everything, with actually understanding the reality that occurred, and wanting to work within it and yet make it all up. I guess it feels like the, the bigger challenge to be able to do both, historical accuracy and taking chances. That, that felt kind of like the holy grail. But I would throw that question back to you. So where does, where does your, you were a journalist for many years and a much more serious one than I have ever been. What, what has your journalistic training, how do you see that at work in your fiction writing, either uh, in methodology or anything else? Well, first of all, that was the pivot for me. People think the pivot was going from being a journalist to being a novelist. I actually always wanted to be a novelist. When I was 11 years old, I went to the local library to look at where my novel would be shelved. Oh, and it was in between so Anne sweet. Rand and Proust. <laughs> Oh, God. Because <laughs> there weren't a whole lot of cues there on the shelves. And I studied fiction writing with Elizabeth Hardwick at Barnard when I was a student. But like a lot of people, I couldn't figure out how you could write fiction and pay rent and send for takeout and things like that. So uh, I went into the newspaper business when I was in college and loved it so much I just stayed and stayed and stayed. But I think so much of what I did in the business informed my ability to produce novels. I mean, it taught me, it taught me to write even when I didn't feel like writing. The, mm -hmm. the essential tool of writing, which is put your butt in a chair. So but, it taught me butt and chair. It taught me to keep it tight, which I think, I mean, I don't know about you, but I read a lot of books now and think, if this had been 40 pages shorter, it would have been, had so much more punch to it. And because I was always writing in 700 or 800 word snippets, I learned what telling details really communicated something to the reader and what was just me in love with the sound of my own voice. And above all, you know, I spent some of the best years of my life writing down people's words verbatim in notebooks. So I think I got pretty good at understanding, first of all, that spoken language is as individual as a fingerprint and that you can delineate a character mm. by the way they talk so completely 
in a way that almost requires very little else about them. And second of all, what real dialogue sounds like. So that sometimes I'll read a novel now and I think, oh, come on, no living human ever spoke the way the people in this book are speaking. And because of all those years as a reporter, um, I, I felt like I really knew how to do that. At the same time that I think that impulse that I had during Black and Blue arose out of me saying, so I, I published a novel called Object Lessons when I was still a columnist at the Times. So then it became the columnist has tried to write a novel. The second one was the columnist thinks she's going to keep doing this, and those were the most savage reviews of my career with the ah, second one. So you're he, being penalized in a way for, yes, for doing this. Yes, both. yes, you can't do both. You can't be a reporter. Tell Pete Dexter, tell yeah. Mike O'Connolly, <laughs> Tell tell all these. Perhaps it's that you can't be a woman and do well. Both. <laughs> that may that may be the case too, um, but there came that moment where I thought, I am a novelist now, and even though I've written a, a number of nonfiction books during that time, the most recent being the the book that's here in hardcover, Nanaville. Now I think of myself as a novelist, and now I get described in print as a novelist, uh, the, the columns have moved way down. And that was, I think, part of the reason that working on Black and Blue, I thought, I do not have to make this literal. But as opposed to you, I'm not working in a historical context. I tend to be writing novels that are set in the current time, in a very discreet period of time, and even the settings, that uh, Miller's Valley is a novel about a a small town in Pennsylvania that eventually winds up underwater because they've decided that they need a new reservoir and it's a very wet place. And I did virtually no research except that at one point someone introduced me to the term a drowned town. The United States is filled with drowned towns where you can go underwater in scuba and still see That's the buildings. Crazy. And I loved the turn of phrase so much that I, I used it in the book. But I did almost no research then. And I think in some ways it's almost a subconscious effort to throw off my own past. That's interesting. We're going to open up for questions in a few minutes. But I want to get back to some. So if you have questions, gather those up. Um, you talked about self-doubt right away, and that's something that I think about a lot um, with regard to writing. It's such a solitary practice. Um, my husband's in the theater. He's, he works communally. Even when things are hard, there's a sense of, you know, kind of joyful, you know, uh, getting through the hard times together. When does self-doubt strike for you, and how do you function amidst it? Um, it strikes for me almost every morning. <laughs> um, the, the little practice that I do that has been invaluable for me is when I end a day, I never end at the end of a chapter, and I never end at the end of a paragraph, and I never end at the end of a sentence. I always end in mid-sentence. Oh, wow. Because if the next morning I came back to the end of a chapter, I could be paralyzed for days, maybe even weeks. But I can almost always manage to finish an existing sentence. And That's sometimes a great idea. that that kickstarts me into the next and the next. But it's all because of that sitting down and looking and thinking, you're no good at this. And it gets worse for me in the middle. Um, but it's why we discussed this. Sorry, Pamela, but I don't read reviews anymore and haven't for four or five books now because the reviews are just more noise in your head. Um, if someone has dinged you on the last book, you think, well, I'm not good at this. If somebody has praised something you did on the last book, but you're not doing it in this book, you think, well, why aren't you doing it again? It's just, it's more self-doubt and more noise. Don't you find, you don't. I mean, I have, struggled a lot with um, self-doubt. It seems to come at different a different time for each book. Um, with Manhattan Beach, I think what made it, it was definitely the hardest book I've written, and I think it really was the fact that I 
felt, I didn't feel fluent in the air. Well, I think it actually gets right back to what I said at the beginning, because time and place are the most important things for me, and I really never write autobiographically, but I do use times and places that I remember from my life. And I, dr I didn't realize how much I kind of needed those memories or that sense of atmosphere of, of things that, um, from my own life that I remember, times and places. Well, writing about New York in the 30s and 40s meant that I had nothing. There was just nothing there. And so it took such a long time before I felt like I had built up almost a kind of alternate memory bank to draw from. And these oral history interviews, and I actually got involved in a, um, a kind of formal oral history project with the Brooklyn Navy Yard and the Brooklyn Historical Society, Part of that, you know, I would listen to these anecdotes and we interviewed lots of women who had worked at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and it was amazing to hear their stories and, and the number of men as well. But a lot of, and I was obsessed with finding out about the work that they did because I kept thinking, must know about shipbuilding. That's what I'm doing here. But in fact, what I think actually helped me more were all these other little details about life that came through, like, like the gangsters, for right. example. Um, so at a certain point, I was able to let my kind of dream approach work because I had heard enough from other people that details would actually come to mind. But there was a long period where I felt like the book was sort of okay, but no better than that. I felt like it was sort of stiff, and it actually reminded me of how I felt when I um, had a, uh, spent a couple of months on a scholarship to Italy when I was learning Italian, and I realized, I'm really dumb in Italian. Like, I can't make a joke, I can't get a joke, I can't express any idea that has any complexity, I can barely talk in the past tense. I mean, what am I in this language? And I kind of felt the equivalent as a writer with Manhattan Beach for quite a while. So it's interesting, what I find, the only thing that really helps me with self-doubt is just keeping going. Yeah. Because the book, Actually, it turns out you can write even thinking you're about to drop dead. You can actually keep going. And so I try to just be very dogged. And, and as the work naturally improves through that effort, I begin to feel more confident. And sometimes you write things that you think are terrible, and then you're two paragraphs in just pushing the rock uphill, and all of a sudden you hit your stride out of that. So the terribleness has led into something better. Exactly. And should we take, do you think we should take questions? Sure, or? if anybody if has. people have questions, okay, I think we do. <laughs> yes. Do you want to... Well, you wrote an entire novel I mean, about things that you haven't experienced, but we were talking backstage about the fact that what we're looking at are two different issues here. One is the issue of you writing about um, things that you haven't experienced, perhaps things that are part of really disenfranchised cultures, but the other is the question of whether talented black, Latino, trans whatever writers have not been given the same opportunities by mainstream publishing houses that their white cisgendered um, brothers and sisters have? I mean, I have to just say, I, I hope it's possible to write about things other than one's own life. I hope that remains possible in our culture because Personally, I do not write ever autobiographically. I am terrible at it. I, my career will, I promise, it will end. I will be, I'll go back to journalism. I do have a plan B. I see that possibility on the rise and I'm like, it might come to that, in which case I'm, I'm back on the beat because I just, I'm not interested in myself. So I love writing from a male point of view, for example. Um, it, it immediately takes me out of myself and I, so I think, the, in a way, I think any writer who's asked this question is probably going to give the same answer, which is, yes, you can, 
but you have to do it carefully and well, and sort of there's the rub, because who decides whether you did it carefully and well? And the answer is I have no idea whether that, <laughs> whether that writer did it carefully or, or, and well, because I haven't read the novel. And, I don't know either. And I, I, and I suspect, I may be wrong, but I suspect there's an enormous amount of opining about that book by people who haven't read it. And that's the rub for me. If you want to read a book and say to me, you know, this was not worth publishing or not worth giving a seven-figure advance to or not making a big fuss about or not being chosen by Oprah, that's one thing. But to opine on it when you haven't read it seems to me essentially wrong. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, oh, God. I want to answer every question. Yes? Hi, uh, Karen. I have two questions. I have a question. First of all, what's your experience with audiences? Because I think that's a I was a street reporter in New York City for a lot of my career. There were, there were no restrictions on where I could go and what I could do and, and what I could see. But also that assumes something about what we should and ought to write about and what can be written about brilliantly. Um, a, 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 a young woman sat in a parsonage in Hampshire for almost her entire life doing nothing. Her name was Jane Austen and she hasn't been out of print ever since she had to pay 50 pounds to have her first book published under the name A Lady. So, I mean, you know, the, the domestic sphere is to me as great a battleground as, um, as, any, um, as any literal battleground and I think sometimes women have more access to that as a subject um, than some of our male counterparts do. Uh, yes. Can you address the title, like, Why a Cat and Not a Dog, and Why Give Up on Something? <laughs> we didn't write that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The question was addressing the title of this talk, which I think was really just about pointers, like things that we think make us write well. Yeah, I wondered who, so someone said no drinking. That definitely wasn't me. Um, <laughs> Um, but we actually touched or on that. Or Faulkner I mean, or Fitzgerald. Yeah. Well, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I don't drink while writing. Um, <laughs> although, I don't know. I think people probably have done that too. But I do think we both agreed. It, I think that title says something about the internet. I turn off the wireless while I'm at the computer working on, it's what, it's what in my church they call a near occasion of sin. And um, um, I'm just too likely to interrupt and go online. I'm very distractible. So I just turn it off for a couple of hours while I'm doing what I do. And I would say one of the great benefits of writing by hand is I'm not actually on a machine when I write. So there's no, uh, I mean, I, I, there are phones, of course. But I find if I just move it outside of my lazy reach, yeah. it's as if it kind of doesn't exist. Uh, yes. So the question is wh how in Manhattan Beach I ended up writing about a severely disabled child. That was a very surprising um, f thing that happened right away when I was writing that first draft. And my first thought was I don't actually want to write about someone with these problems. Um, I mean, honestly, just from a logistical standpoint, writing about someone who can't move very much or talk is difficult and potentially very undramatic in writing and therefore there's the danger of just using them as a symbol and sort of a prop and I didn't like any of that. Um, but she felt very essential to the story actually. But the, it's interesting, it's very analogous to the gangster thing. In my talks with so many people um, who had memories of the war years, 
I would, and, and also just in, in reading correspondence and other things, there, it would often come up that there were people who couldn't leave home. And again and again, I came upon this. So someone couldn't leave home because of a mental or physical issue, and therefore someone else often couldn't leave home because they couldn't be alone at home. And it, it got, it was sort of a, another one of these refrains that sort of caught in my mind, and it led me to wonder what on earth it would be like to live in Row House, New York, with all stairs and really no provisions for people with other needs. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So of course you couldn't leave home. I mean, people are living in five and six floor walk-ups. Um, so somehow my curiosity about what that would actually mean for a family, what the ramifications would be, how it could actually destroy certain families. Um, obviously my curiosity was aroused and that immediately found its way into the material. That's how. Isn't, don't you find that kind of exciting though when things present themselves? Every Very. once in a while I'll be tootling along and I go, oh my God, this is happening. And it hasn't occurred to me until then. It just, it, I mean, at the risk of sound, making it sound much easier than it is, it sort of presents itself. And, and those are kind of thrilling moments for me. I agree. I mean, it's a very, there's a mystery at the heart of this process. Absolutely. Which is, which is the human mind synthesizing experience. That's what we do when we dream, and, and it's what consciousness is doing all day long for us. And it, it's, it's, that, it's really that happening sort of in real time, and it, it can be quite, a, quite exciting. Yes, the gentleman. So the question was just if you're going gangbusters with a book and suddenly and you have a flirtation of a different idea comes along, I'm going to let you take that one. <laughs> Occasionally that will happen to me and I sort of park it. I park it because, again, it's a near occasion of sin. It's a way of my unconscious <laughs> mind really saying, you're a to Catholic. Me, <laughs> saying to me, oh, Anna, you can get out of this conundrum <laughs> that your current book is expressing to you. But occasionally, once or twice that's happened, and it's been the germ of what's going to be the next novel, once or twice. But I usually soldier on with, with what I've got. I think we can take one more because yeah. they've told us when this clock gets to our zero, mics they're, go off. they're cutting our mics. <laughs> yes. Uh, I wanted to ask you both, if you were to uh, take a look at your work, what would you, how would you describe your inner voice, your inner voice? Not from someone else's point of view, but from a very personal level. What have you gleaned over the years about your own work? Oh, that's a big question. What, what have we learned over the years in one minute and 52 seconds about our inner voices and how they work? Um, I, I'm going to just say quickly that I find that each book requires its own voice, and, the, and the, one of the biggest challenges for me is finding that voice, and there's often sort of a hangover of the, the voice of the previous book, which I have to kind of shake and, and sort of stop those echoes um, so I'm not sure that I have a specific voice that's really mine, which may be strange, but I, I guess what I feel, I feel like um, I have a set of interests that I return to, you know, the impacts of image culture being one, but I, I guess I am really a chameleon at the core. I, I feel like I adapt to myself and, and the voice that I use to the, the story that emerges from whatever time and place I'm grappling with. What I would say is because I'm so distractible, I try to make each book different because I want to, I'm interested in scaring myself professionally. It's why I've bounced from job to job to job and why each of my novels feel in some ways quite different from the one before because I want to wake up in the morning and say, ah, but can you do this? And that's what I've tried to do um, with each book. Having said that, it's become very clear to me over the years that I really write by ear. That the prose has to sound a certain way in my mouth for me to find it 
compelling, interesting, and desirable. Thank you all. We can thank keep the conversation you. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>